Hello, everyone. Welcome back to our class. Uh, so this class is uh, Psych 5, Personal and Social Awareness. And uh, this is a, a Fast Track 2 class, uh, which is uh, in, the, in the spring semester of uh, two, 2021. And then we'll come back uh, in, in the second week. And uh, this week, the major topic is about reviewing the stuff covered in the developmental psychology. I believe that uh, in introduction to psychology class, we have uh, learned about developmental psychology at least uh, for one week, I think. And uh, today in our class, we still going, we are still going to review developmental psychology, and uh, we uh, kind of focus on. Uh, different uh, focus on developmental psychology through a slightly different angle compared to uh, introduction to psychology class. In that class, uh, we just learned uh, everything, uh, the basic stuff about de developmental psychology. But this in this uh, week, we'll uh, talk about uh, some specialized uh, topics, such as how to understand human development. We are going to talk about some uh, uh, theoretical theoretical frameworks that understand human development, such as attachment theory, such as uh, Erickson's psychosocial view of uh, human development. And also, we are going to talk about some uh, characteristics of uh, childhood. There are different kinds of uh, different life stages of in childhood and adolescence. We are going to talk about uh, the characteristics of uh, early childhood, infancy, middle childhood, and adolescence in chapter two. Uh, be sure that uh, uh, before you watching the lecture video, uh, you have read uh, chapter two and three for this week. Uh, so in chapter two, we're going to talk about uh, the stuff in uh, childhood and uh, adolescence and the characteristics of uh, each uh, like smaller life stages of, in childhood and adolescence. And uh, so far, uh, let's uh, start the lecture. So how to understand our childhood and our adolescence? How to understand personal development? How to understand how and why people grow and in what formats or in what forms? So here is a really important theoretical framework that, that we can know about. That's called the psychosocial view theory. It's a theory developed by the uh, really famous psychologist, Eric Erickson. So he was a, a psychologist from uh, Denmark and he moved to United States in the 20th century. And he was from a Jewish family. He was a professor in America for many years. And uh, through his uh, research and studies, he gradually develop the uh, psychosocial view of how human develop. And uh, that theory is about entire lifespan of everybody. So uh, Erickson is a, uh, is not a comparative of uh, Sigmund Freud. He was uh, later than Sigmund Freud. And also his view was different from uh, Sigmund Freud's. So as you know, Sigmund really focused on sexuality. So he believed that the every motive, every re reason that uh, humans are living, why uh, people are doing th those kind of things because of sexuality. Sexuality is the really basic drive of every human. So for his focus on uh, sexuality, but Erickson focused on the social factors. 
Erickson believed that uh, why people can grow is because they live in a social environment. The social environment or the society helps everybody to grow, to become a more mature person. So that's the uh, characteristic of Eric Erickson's uh, theory about his, uh, human development. So what is the emphasis of uh, his uh, view about human development? So first of all, he, uh, his theory really focuses on the social factors, focus on the impact of social environment. So he believed that the person, the self, actually grows through the uh, process of interacting with social and cultural environment. Namely, when everybody is born, everybody is living in the social environment and everybody is able to grow, is able to become mature because they are living in the social and cultural environment. So that's, how, that's the philosophy of Erickson's view of human development. And also there are different stages of development. So uh, during the, as the person grows up, there are different stages. In every stage, there are different trends. There are different major tasks that that person needs to finish to grow. So in the certain stage, if this person successfully finished the certain task, that is corresponding to that stage. And that person is able to grow up and uh, come, uh, will come to the next stage. And uh, that's a really interesting point because I don't see a lot of, uh, I don't see any other uh, theories that uh, uh, mention that oh, there are different stages of development and everybody needs to uh, finish the task for every stage so that they can grow. So uh, finishing the major task in, in those stages is not a really good, uh, is not a really easy thing to do. So uh, the people will have struggles in every stage because the, it's challenging, it's very challenging sometimes for everybody <clears throat> in a certain stage. So they need to have a struggles in the uh, try try uh, put an uh, effort and uh, try their best to finish the task in that stage. And also, there is a core struggle for every stage. There is a one core major task to do to finish in every stage, and correspondingly, there is a core struggle for every stage. If they cannot finish the task successfully, because it's really challenging, crisis may emerge in that stage. So there may be potentially crisis when they cannot successfully finish the task. So there can be crisis. Uh, when crisis emerge, the people may successfully uh, solve the problems or uh, overcome the crisis so they can go forward. What if they cannot? They'll, they go backward. They cannot uh, uh, compete. They cannot overcome the crisis. They cannot uh, successfully finish the task in that stage. So they go backward. They cannot grow well. And uh, in the entire lifespan, there are eight possible stages for everyone. So, uh, you know, everyone is different. Everyone has different uh, uh, personalities and everyone is unique, but everyone share the uh, same characteristic, which is that uh, everyone needs to go through these eight stages. And the 
core uh, major task for every stage for everyone are the same. So that's uh, uh, sum up this the story that uh, this uh, theory told, tells us. So there are different stages and people grow. People try to grow. To grow, there are major tasks that people need to finish for every stage. And the tasks are challenging. It's not easy. You know, growing is not a really easy thing to do. It's not just uh, having fun and then grow. It's challenging. The every task is very challenging. So people have struggles. When they cannot overcome those struggles or over overcome those difficulties, they may meet the crisis. In the crisis, they may go further or they may go backward. So that's the uh, basically the story of Erickson's so psychosocial view. So here is right now, here's a task for you to do. So it's not a life task, but it's a, a small task for you to do when you are watching this video. So you need to find out the characteristics of each life stage out of the eight life stages. So for example, first of all, you need to find out what the task is in every stage under the uh, psychosocial view of uh, human development. So you can uh, find out the task for every stage from the task book. You can find out from uh, the internet, from online, from other people, or uh, from other res uh, sources. So after all, you find what the task is for every stage in terms of the uh, Erickson's uh, psychosocial view. And also you need to find out in every stage, the abilities and the capabilities that people can develop. So when they finish those tasks, during the process of finishing each task, they are able to de develop certain abilities and capabilities that is different for every stage. So find out what kind of abilities and capabilities can be developed in the in, in every stage. And also you need to find the potential problems. What kind of potential problems or crisis that people may meet for every stage. And also the last components you need to find out is any examples of successful or problematic development. Those examples may from yourself or from other people that you can see or observe. So from anywhere in the in life, find uh, some examples of successful development or problematic development. In other words, uh, you may find examples that oh, you can fit, successfully finish the task or uh, some people may meet some crisis or they have struggles, they cannot finish the task in that stage. So you can find those examples. So you can pause the video right now and uh, find out these elements for every stage. And there are eight life stages in total. Find all those elements right now and pause the video. And uh, during this process, you can take notes. So can you rem remember what you are, uh, what you find? Okay, so let's uh, let's go to specific each uh, stage. So there are eight stages in total, and there's a certain task to finish for each stage. Let's uh, look at the each stage. So the first stage is from the uh, from the beginning, from the from the first day of life to one year old. So the major task is to build the trust 
with the caregivers or with any people that the, the baby needs. So the major development task for this stage is trust versus mistrust. So when they can finish, finish this task, namely they can uh, successfully trust others, they can go to the next stage. Uh, in this under this circumstance, with uh, let's say that uh, oh, they success, uh, successfully overcome the crisis or they do not meet any crisis. Uh, what if they, they cannot successfully finish this task? They mean uh, the babies may meet uh, the uh, crisis, which is mistrust. They cannot build the trust with other people, especially with caregivers. So why in this stage, why trust is the major task for this stage? Think about it. Because in this stage, the babies are just born, but they cannot have the, the ability to seek the food and feed themselves, right? So because human babies are really vulnerable, so human babies are not like uh, babies of other animals, like horses or uh, sheep or cattle. So those, those babies, they, when they are born, they can run. They can find the food by themselves. So they're they are pretty strong newborns, but human newborns are really vulnerable, weak. They, can, they must totally rely on their mothers or any kind of caregivers. So the first thing they need to achieve is to build the trust with the caregivers so that they can trust the caregivers so the caregivers can smoothly give them the care, including the uh, affection, including the nourishment, means that uh, they need uh, the basic uh, stuff like uh, water, food, or, uh, and uh, the uh, safe, a safe environment that uh, the babies can grow up. So those be basic needs must be met, but the babies themselves cannot accurately satisfy their own basic needs. So they need to trust. They need to trust the caregivers so that they can survive in this stage. When they can successfully build the trust with the caregivers, they go to the next stage, which usually happens between age one and age three. So that's the second stage. The major task is to build the autonomy. So what is autonomy? So it's a, it's a sense, it's a sense that people have that uh, they believe that they can be independent in doing things. They are autonomous. They believe that they are autonomous. They can do whatever they wanna do. They can do things based on their own will, based on their own will. So people have will, they have free will. If they wanna do something, they are able to do it. So that's a sense of autonomy. So babies or the, the children in this stage, they need to build the sense that they are autonomous. They have the autonomy to do things independently. They don't have to rely on other people to do it, or they are not controlled by other people. They are not controlled by the destiny or fate or environment. They themselves can control themselves. So that's the sense they need to develop. If they finish the major task in this stage, they can develop a sense of uh, autonomy. What if they meet the crisis? They may have a sense of shame and doubt, self-doubt. They doubt themselves. They kind of uh, uh, really have a really uh, doubtful attitude toward their, their own ability to do things independently. They don't believe themselves. 
they don't believe that they can rely on all themselves to uh, get what they want. And also they are shameful about themselves because they think that they're not, you know, they're not worthy. It's not right. They will think that there is not right to, to have desires. It's not a right to do things independently. So at first they want to do something independently. They want to explore the world independently. They want to satisfy their own basic needs independently instead of relying on their caregivers. But if they fail to do that, it will, it will backfire. It, they'll have a sense of shame. So it, they will think that, oh, it's not, they, you shouldn't have those, uh, they shouldn't have those desires to, to build an independent ability to do many things. So that's the uh, outcome if they have the crisis, if they cannot be autonomous. So that's the second stage. And as uh, the children grow up, they go to the third stage of entire life's demand. So you, you may notice that uh, these stages, those uh, the first four stages are really short. So from zero, uh, from age zero to one, that's that's just the first stage. And they, when children are about one year old, they go to the next stage, the second stage. The second stage only lasts for about two years and they quickly go to the third stage. So, you know, uh, during the first uh, a few years of every person's life, they grow fast. Babies change really, really, really fast. They become mature really, really fast. So in the third stage, that's from age uh, three to six. So in this stage, uh, they are often called toddlers. So there is a name for children with this age, so toddlers. What's the uh, major task for toddlers? They want to take initiatives. So that's kind of a related to building autonomy. So taking initiatives means that they want to proactive start something instead of uh, doing something that other people tell them to do or doing something that they keep doing all the time. They want to do some new things. They want to involve in some new kind of uh, activities. So they want to take the initiatives. For example, they want to travel to some kind of new place. Nobody tells them to do so. And their parents never uh, mentioned this, but they want to do that. They want to travel to a place that never been to. So they want to take the initiatives or they want to ride bicycles. Probably see other children ride, riding bicycles and they want to take uh, ride bicycles too, even though nobody tells them to do so. And they have never had this kind of experience before, but they want to take initiatives. They want to have the feeling that, oh, they can do new things. They can involve new things. So they, if they can successfully take initiatives, they are really success, successful in this stage, but what if they can't? They meet uh, the crisis that they may meet in this stage is that they cannot take initiatives successfully. They will develop a sense of guilt. They feel guilty because they cannot take initiatives successfully. Yeah, they want to do something, but they cannot do it. And then they, they will have a sense of guilty. They will think that, oh, I do not treat myself well because uh, I cannot satisfy myself. So that's the outcome of the crisis. And uh, when they are about seven year old, they go to the stage four which is from uh, age seven to age 11. 
So that's the period that uh, most children go to elementary school. So those elementary school children are in stage four generally. So in this stage, they should uh, uh, build a sense of trust with other people already, kind of some to some degree. No matter, uh, some children may uh, be really successful, but some children may not be really successful. Successful, but to to a certain degree, they are able to build a, a trust with other people, and also they are able to be autonomous. They are able to take initiatives to some degree. And this time, they want to develop a sense that they are capable. They are able to be successful in some tax tasks. So it's, this stage is really critical for them to develop a self-confidence in abilities. So that's what the industry means. The industry means that uh, they have a sense of uh, self-confidence. So what if they cannot? What if they meet the crisis? They want to build the self-confidence, but they found that they, they fail. They fail all the time. They fail most of the time in the tasks. They will have a sense of inferiority. They think that they are inferior to other people. They are like, they are, they are not capable. They think that, oh, they are not as capable as other kids or other people. They think that uh, they shouldn't have the ability to achieve the things that they want to achieve. So that's the crisis that they meet. So that's the uh, stage four. Uh, trying to, it's about trying to develop the sense of self, uh, self confidence versus uh, de developing a sense of uh, being fairer to other people. The next stage, stage five, is from age 12 to age 18. So in this stage, it's not about autonomy, autonomy. it's not about self-confidence, it's not about trust. It is about the position in a society, which is identity. So in this stage, it's really important for everyone to build the identity and roles in a society. So identity is the position in the society. For example, when we go to school, we are students. So student is one identity. So we think ourselves as students. As myself, I am an instructor. So I identify uh, me, our, myself as instructor. So instructor is one of the identities in the society. So identity is about where we put ourselves in the society. We may put ourselves in different places in, in the society, like ch child, like son, daughter, father, mother, grandfather, grandmother or different kinds of occupations like student, instructor, policeman, lawyer, nurse, doctor. So all these are identities in the society. So uh, in adolescence, uh, namely from age 12 to 18 in, in stage five, they, it's really critical to develop a sense of identity. And they will experiment with different identities. They want to find themselves. They want to find where they are in the society because they want to assimilate into the society. So in this stage is a really uh, important stage for socialization because be uh, before uh, age stage five, from age one to age uh, stage four, it's mainly about interacting with the family, interacting with the caregivers, interacting with the parents. So uh, children in those stages do not really think about where they are in the society because they haven't entered the society really yet. But starting from stage five, uh, stage five they start to 
assimilate into the society. So they want to find where they are in the society. They want to find out the relationships between themselves and other all other people in the society. So that's why the major task for stage five is to build the identity. What if they cannot? They are confused. If they cannot successfully build the identity, they are confused. They're confused what they are, like well, what position they are in. So that's the crisis that may, they may meet. And the uh, next stage is from age 19 to uh, 29. So that's, uh, that stage is basically the young adulthood. So starting from uh, age 18 or age 19, people are not children or adolescent anymore. They become adults. They are young adults in this stage, in age, stage six. So in this stage, they go to college, they start to work, they start to build families, they start to uh, get married. So in this stage, the major task for them to do is to build the intimacy with other people, like romantic relationships. They try to build all kinds of relationships with other people because they are in the society already. They try to build the intimate relationships with their uh, girlfriend or boyfriend, or uh, if they are get married, they are married, they, uh, they try to build the intimate relationships with their wife or husband. Uh, when they are working, they try to build relationships with their leaders, with their managers, with their co uh, co-workers, their colleagues, and so forth. In the college, they try to build the relationships uh, with uh, other students, for example. So they are fully connected to the to the world to the society because they have uh, they have uh, uh, been connected to the society really deeply so uh, the following stage is to establish good relationships and intimate close really close relationships with other people so the major task for this stage is to build intimacy what if they meet the crisis they have, they will have a sense of isolation. They feel that, oh, I cannot meet, the, I cannot uh, build the relationships with other people. I cannot find a girlfriend or boyfriend. I cannot hang out well with, or I, I cannot get along well with uh, other colleagues or other students. So that, that's the sense of isolation. They feel isolated from the society, from other people. So that's the crisis of that stage. And stage seven is from age 30 to 64. I think this age range is, is not their clear cut. It's just a, like a, something like a vague age range. It's basically like a middle adulthood. So you can, uh, view stage seven as middle adulthood, view age six as the young adulthood. So it's not really uh, that, that sure that, oh, if you go to age 30, you must go to age, uh, stage seven. It's not that case. It's just uh, roughly speaking, age seven is corresponding to middle adulthood. Age, age, uh, stage six is corresponding to young adulthood. So in uh, stage seven, they have built an identity. They have built a close relationships with other people. They have formed the families for a lot of people. They have uh, the uh, stable uh, jobs. So what, what, what happened next? What they want next? They want to contribute to the whole society. They want to maintain the family. They want to be part of the family. They want to uh, raise the children. They want to have offsprings. They want to have kids. They want to, you know, build big family. 
So this stage, the major task is called the generativity. So it means that they want to uh, create the next generation. They want to uh, have like, they want to make some, uh, make a difference in the society, not only assimilated to the society, but they want to change the society. They want to uh, make this world or make this society a better, a better place. So what if they meet the crisis? That uh, state is called a stagnation. It means that uh, they, they think that uh, they cannot, they fail to do so. They fail to make a contribute to the society. They fail to have uh, offsprings or have uh, children. They fail to maintain the family or raise the family. That's the feeling that they have. And the uh, next stage, stage uh, eight, is uh, from about age 65. But it's not really rough. It's not really clear cut. So uh, basically, age, uh, stage eight is corresponding to uh, late adulthood, when people are old. So the major task for this stage is to make sense of their own life, to evaluate their own life because they have almost, uh, they have, they have, they have gone through all the, almost all the stages and uh, they have, they have grown up, they have uh, built a family, they have, uh, have their own careers. They have uh, contributed to the society already. So right now in this stage, they want to make sense of their life. They will review their own life and uh, from their memory to see if their life is meaningful or not, whether they have a meaningful life or not. They want to make sense of life. They want to see that their life is worthy, is worthy to have an entire life. Otherwise, why they are living in this world. So they want to make sense of the life. If they can successfully uh, finish this task, there, there can be integrity. So what if they cannot? What if they review their life and uh, think that they cannot, their life is not meaningful? Their life is uh, like empty not really fruitful, they will despair. So they're, they're, they'll be disappointed by their themselves. So that's the uh, state of uh, despair. So that's the uh, last stage. So let's look at the uh, eight stages as a whole. So you can see that from age one to five, all these five stages are about uh, childhood and adolescence. From uh, age six to age eight, uh, stage six to stage eight, these three stages are about uh, adulthood. You can see that uh, when, uh, when people are really young, when people are children, they change very fast. They go through this each stage really, really fast. Only uh, three or four or two years, they, they go through one stage. Yeah. Gradually, they'll build the uh, abilities or build the, the sense to grow up. And uh, for each stage, the major task is really uh, essential for the survival during that stage. So for the first stage, trust with others is really essential for the survival. In the second stage, building a sense of autonomy is really essential. The third stage is really similar to the second stage, uh, building the sense of 
uh, building a sense that they can take initiatives. Initiatives is really essential. The next stage, uh, developing the self-confidence is really essential for, for people. And all these senses or abilities, these are foundations. These are really important for everybody, everybody's survival. And with these foundations, they can assim they can be assimilated to the society. So they need to build the ident identities. After building all kinds of identities, they want to uh, be more competent or have uh, have a further growth in the society. So they may need to. Uh, build the intimate relationships with other people, different kinds of intimate relationships. And after that, they want to contribute to the society. They are not satisfied with uh, close relationships. They are going to seek to contribute to the society. They want to make a difference in the society. And after that, they become a uh, Old, so they want to review their own life and make sense of life. They want to see that, oh, this life is really meaningful. I'm satisfied with it. Yeah, so that's the eight stages of life. That's very interesting because Erickson's theory about human development is, uh, I think it may make sense. Uh, this theory, I make sense of this uh, theory really well. I think it's, it, it's, that's the case uh, because uh, in my personal, uh, personal experience, I can see uh, people from different ages are struggling. I can see that uh, the children are struggling to build autonomy, struck, struggling to uh, take initiatives. I can see that adolescents are confused about wh who they are, confused about how to interact with others, how to put themselves in the society. And I, ca I can also see that older adults, elder adults, they oftentimes make sense of life. They oftentimes recall something that they did in the, when they, are, they were young. They want to make sense of their life. I think this uh, theory really uh, is a really good tool for us to understand how human develop. Each of us must go through all the stages must uh, uh, finish all the tasks that uh, are listed in this uh, table. No matter how you think, no matter what culture you are, no matter what language you speak, you must go through all these eight stages. I think that's really interesting theory to know about. And with this theory, we can know how we are and what can we do in each life stage. So it's really a, a really meaningful theory to know about. Okay, so let's go to next part. So in this chapter today, we are going to talk about uh, four life stages, not the life stages that in the uh, psychosocial view, but in the life stages that uh, uh, developmental psychology usually uh, classify. So the first one is infancy. Infancy is from the birth to age two. So that's why they are called infants or baby. And the next one is uh, childhood, but childhood is divided into three parts. Actually, all these are childhood, but the first stage from uh, before age two, that's infancy. From age two to six, that's early childhood. From uh, age, uh, age six to 12, that's middle childhood. So there's early, there's middle, then there's, there's no late childhood, but there's the adolescence. You can see it as a, like late childhood, but it's adolescence is like a, uh, connection between childhood and uh, adulthood. 
So like it's like a transition stage it's from age uh, 13 to 20. So let's uh, talk about each one of them. So infancy is from birth to age two. That actually covers two Erickson stages, life stages. Uh, stage one, trust versus mistrust, and stage two, autonomy versus shame and doubt. So let's look at it. So to understand infancy, there is a theory that we must know. There is a theory we cannot get rid of. That's called attachment theory. I think that, I believe that every one of you have learned that theory uh, in the Psych 1 class. Let's review attachment theory here. It's by, uh, it's uh, developed by the uh, psychologist John Bowlby in 1970s. Yeah, it's like not really long ago. Attachment is a concept to understand how babies or how infants build psychological connections with their caregivers. So Bobby defined the attachment as a very lasting psychological connection between human beings, especially between infants and their caregivers such as mom, dad, or any other kind of uh, caregivers. So it's a, very, it's a psychological connection. It's an emotional connection, but that connection is very lasting. It's not a, like a emotion. You can be happy right now, and, but you can be sad next moment. But uh, attachment is very long lasting. It, have, it lasts for in the entire life. Yeah, last for entire life. It's, it is, uh, it is built during infancy, but it will last for the entire life. So it mean, means that uh, people will have the attachment there with their caregivers for their entire life, right? So just look at yourself and, and other people's life. That's the case. It's an emotional bond with another. And uh, the, the person who builds attachment with, with that caregiver, the person will perceive the caregiver as a source of safety or security. So it means that if the baby is born and the baby gradually builds attachment with their mom, and the baby will think, will perceive the mom as the source of the security, it means that Every time the baby sees the mom or is around the mom or think about mom, the baby will have a sense of safety. The baby will think, will uh, feel that there's, the baby is safe. The baby is secure. There's no danger in the environment. So when the baby has the emotion, really strong emotion bond or attachment with the caregiver, the baby will have a feeling of security, will feel safe because the caregiver is a source of security. That's where the safety or security comes from. And uh, the relationship coming from the attachment is really close, caring, and enduring. So it lasts a very long time and it's really caring, it's really close. Very, very, very strong emotional bond. So why we know about attachment? Why we need to know about this? Because uh, every close relationship that we can have is based on the attachment that we have when we are infants. Means that when we are infants, we build attachment with our caregivers. That attachment, that emotional bond becomes a framework for us to build other relationships. So in other words, every relationship that we can build is from attachment, is from the connection with our caregiver, is from that attachment with the caregiver.
and because the uh, uh, children, it's natural that uh, children internalize their the patterns of the relationships, and these patterns become the blueprints for future relationships. That means that uh, in our life, our the, our first relationship is uh, with our caregiver, Yuri. That first relationship becomes the becomes the root, becomes a blueprint for any other relationships in the future. So it's like a uh, we we uh, we create a one copy of a video game, and then we can create a. Uh, any number of uh, copies for that video game. For all those uh, copies, we actually those copies are about one video game. It it feels like that. If we can build a really really successfully build a really good attachment with our caregiver, it's really possible that we can build a really good relationships with other people in the future. It's like just the, like copying the, the first relationship. And also uh, for infants, it's really critical to build an emotional bond with the caregiver because that is really critical for survival. We have talked about, uh, when we talk about uh, stage one in Erickson's psychosocial view, because we need to build some kind of sense that we can trust that person because that person is giving us the care the caregiver must give uh, all kinds of care to the to the infants so the infants can survive. So for infants, the most important thing to do before age two is to build the attachment with the caregiver. So attachment is really critical for survival and also is really critical for future relationships. So let's uh, now uh, watch a video uh, about a experiment that shows how attachment work. Because uh, there are people build attachment with their caregivers, but there are different kinds of attachments. There are actually different kinds of, of attachment. So that's how, uh, let's see how uh, children behave when they have a different attachment. Let's watch it. This experiment, which I watched through a two-way mirror, is designed to gauge how secure is the crucial relationship between mother and child. The value of the test has been established in studies that would watch a child one-year-old and then follow it up and interview them about their relationships to their parents when they were 21 years old. So we're quite confident in the long-term significance of this relationship. After several minutes play, the mother is signaled to leave the room. reaction to her mother's return. The important clue is whether the baby's able to become calmed down by the contact with the mother to get back to play. Sometimes it takes a couple of minutes. You see, when the mother was out, she was only interested in the mother, no interest in the toys. Now she has a contact with her mother. She's beginning to show a little interest in the environment. And shortly, she'll be right back with the toys where we started. So you would call this a secure one? Yes. Yeah. She's getting much heavier. Yeah. Most of the door following her. Now, we, we sent the mother right back in. Now, the point here is not to distress the baby. We're just trying to challenge it. The baby 
puts her hands to her face, a sad expression, puts her face down. When she picks her up, she keeps her head down, her arms out, and then she sits in the chair holding the baby. The baby's still sullen. He's low keyed. So you would call the, this insecure? Yes, attention. insecure. He's avoidant. He's he's not engaging her, and it's not the, the reunion's not effective. And it's important to remember here that the thing that upset him was her absence. Her her return should be the solution to his problem. Now this is another pattern that we see in babies who are not good at using their mother as a secure base right. at home. This baby is also insecure. But you'll see, we get a look at his play before the separation. The mother's left. When she returns, she picks him up. He can't calm down. He's still upset. She offers a toy to amuse him or to comfort him or to distract him, and he slaps it away. She offers another. He slaps it away. He's angry. He's, he's, we call these babies resistant or ambivalent because they both want her back and yet can't use the contact. We think that the difficulty is that in the past, when he sought comfort, she's been inconsistent as to whether she's available and responsive or not. Okay, so uh, in this video, it shows the uh, experiments that uh, Either says different kinds of attachments. So that's uh, that's that's uh, let, let me uh, introduce the basic steps of this uh, experiment. So first of all, first of all, a mother and uh, her child enters a strange room. So that's the room that uh, the mother and the, the child never entered before. So that's the strange environment. You can see that uh, in this small room, there are two chairs, there are some paintings on the wall and there are some toys on the ground. And uh, the child feels uh, insecure, I would say, in, uh, uh, not safe because that's the strange environment. That's the environment that the, the child never, uh, never has been to. Uh, so the mother, Guys, the guys, the child and enters this room, and the mother stays with the child for like a one or two minutes. And that's the first step. And the second step, the mother leaves the room, but leave the the child alone in this room. That's the second step. The second step, uh, a camera is taking the is recording the uh, what happened in the room. So. They want to see what how uh, the child reacts when the mom mom uh, leaves. And the third step, after a, a few minutes or one minute, the mother mother comes back and uh, trying to comfort the uh, the child. And also, in the third step, uh, the experimenters want to see how the child reacts. So in the second step, which, uh, in which uh, the mother leaves the room and uh, the child is alone in this room, all the children are anxious, are crying. They stop playing. So in the first step, the uh, children start to look at the paintings and start to uh, interact with the mom, start to uh, play in the, playing with the toys. They start to in, in implore, explore the environment. That's what usually children do in the strange environment. Uh, but in the second step, all children stop playing. All children um, are really anxious. They are sad, they are crying, and all kinds of uh, neg uh, negative emotions. Uh, so it means that when the mother leaves, they don't feel secure, they don't feel safe. So that's we are th why they are crying. And that's why they are stop. They they stop uh, uh, playing toys because the you know uh, staying safe is is more important than playing with the toys. And in the third step, the mother comes back. However, 
different children have different reactions. So in this video, it shows, uh, there, it shows the uh, three kinds of uh, babies. The first, in the first example, the, the mom comes back, the baby uh, return to the uh, regular emotion. So they start to calm down, start to feel happy again because the mother comes back. The source of security come back, comes back. But uh, there is in the second example. Yeah, that's the first example. In the second example, this uh, boy, uh, when the moms come back, this boy cannot calm down. This boy cannot be happy again. This boy is still like, is still upset, is still sad. And, and also he tried to avoid the contact with the mother. That's the second type of baby. In the, in the third example, uh, this boy is uh, have different kind of reaction. When the co mother comes back, the, uh, the boy is still crying. He's trying to contact, he's trying to have a contact with the interaction with mom, but he's still crying. He's not, a, he can, cannot calm down. He cannot be happy again. So that's the third type of babies. So from this video, we can see that when the mom leaves, the source of security is gone. All the babies are upset, are anxious, are crying, stop playing. They have all kinds of negative emotions. But uh, when the moms come back, they are different. They have different re reactions because they build different kinds of attachment with their own mothers. So what are the different kinds of attachments? So let's, uh, let's look at this table. So in the, there are majorly three types of uh, attachment. We call them uh, different kinds of attachment styles. Yeah, so in psychology, we call them attachment style, styles. The first one is, uh, is called a secure attachment. That attachment is a secure one. And why is that? Because the child can see the caregiver as a secure base or a source of a security. And when this uh, secure base is uh, around, the baby is able to explore the world. <clears throat> it, uh, you can see that uh, in the in the video that video that uh, the children are playing with the toy uh, toys, and see the see what happened on the wall, see the paintings on the wall. So when the secure base is around, the ch the child can perceive can feel us, uh, can have a sense of security so that uh, they actively explore the environment. <clears throat> they are happy, they are active when the caregiver is there. When the caregiver leaves, they are upset, they are anxious because the source of the security is gone. But when the caregiver comes back, they are happy again because the source of the security comes back they do not have the reason to cry or to be upset again anymore. So what's the consequence? When people have a secure attachment style with their caregiver when they are young, when they grow up, they can trust others because they can build a sense of trust with the caregiver so that they can, in their mind, in their hearts, they're just, there's a, seed of trust that is built in their own mind. When they grow up, the seed of trust becomes fruits. So they can trust others. They can maintain good relationships with others because all those relationships are the, are the copies of 
the first relationship with the caregiver. So the secure attachment is really important for everybody to build good relationships with others when, when, we, when they are growing up or when they grow up. The second type of attachment is called anxious ambivalent attachment. So att this attachment is not a secure one. It's not a secure, it's an anxious attachment, but it's one type of anxious attachment is ambivalent. The children do not see the caregiver as a secure base. They are not able to, they do not think that the, the caregiver is not is secure enough. When the caregiver is present because they do not perceive the caregiver as a secure base so that they do not really explore the environment when the caregiver, caregiver is present. When the caregiver leaves, they're distressed because they lack the sense of security. When the care caregiver comes back, they're angry still, they're helpless. They cannot calm down, they cannot be happy again. So this kind of attachment is what uh, uh, Bobby said in that video that they kind of want the contact with the caregiver, but they cannot use the contact. So that's why they are, uh, that's really ambiv ambivalent. On one side, they want the attachment. On the other side, they cannot trust uh, this attachment, cannot trust this caregiver. They want caregiver, but they cannot uh, trust the caregiver. They want it, but they cannot get it. That's the, that's that's why it, it that's so ambivalent. As a consequence, when they grow up, they cannot trust others. They're they they are afraid of being rejected. They are difficult to maintain good relationships with other people because these anxious and ambivalent attachment becomes the becomes a blueprint for future relationships. When they are pretty young, the, in the first relationship, they cannot build a sense of trust. They cannot build a sense uh, that uh, this caregiver is secure. They are not able to really build good relationships with others because they cannot really trust others. And the third type is called anxious avoidant attachment. So it's another type of uh, anxious attachment, but, it, but it's an avoidant attachment. Uh, so when the caregiver is there, they avoid or ignore the caregiver. Why? Because they cannot perceive the caregiver as a secure base at all. So this caregiver is not something that provides the sense of security for them. So they avoid the caregiver. The caregiver is useless. So why, why they care about a caregiver? Why they contact with the caregiver if the caregiver is useless? So they avoid and ignore the caregiver. They do not explore the environment because they do not have a sense of security in their mind. So they need, everyone needs the sense of security. Everyone needs the secure base. But for this kind of a people, this kind of babies, they cannot build the attachment with the caregiver. As a result, they do not have a sense of security at all in their mind. As a result, they do not explore the environment. They do not feel safe. Feeling safe is important than exploring the world, exploring the environment. They do not have a sense of security, so they do not explore the world or they explore the environment little. When the caregiver uh, comes back, they, they keep avoiding or ignoring the caregiver. So they don't have a lot of emotions when the caregiver comes back. They're not distressed, they're not uh, happy, they're not upset. They just don't have emotions. They don't have a really strong emotions at least. Why, why is that? Because the, the, that caregiver, caregiver is not a secure base at the first place. So no matter, uh, no matter if the caregiver leaves or comes back, 
the secure base is not there. They do not have a sense of security. So for this kind of babies, when they grow up, they cannot trust others. Uh, maybe it's worse than the anxious and ambivalent attachment baby. So they cannot trust others because they do not have the this experience of building trust with others. In the, in the blueprint of their relationship patterns, there's no trust, there's no secure base, there's no attachment, there's no emotional bond. So that they cannot maintain good relationships with others. Uh, so you can see that for these two kinds of attachment styles, anxious ambivalent or anxious avoidant attachment styles, people cannot uh, maintain good relationships or cannot have good, uh, really good intimate relationships with the other people. But for people with a secure attachment style, they are able to. So sometimes the, this person cannot build good relationships with us, not because other reason, not because other people are not good or not because environment is not good, just because they do not build the secure attachments when they're infants before age two. So the period from uh, birth to age two is really critical for everyone, whether uh, to, for everyone to build the ability to have good relationships, have intimate relationships with other people. And also this period is really critical for almost everything in, uh, in our uh, human development. And uh, the ability to have intimate relationships is one aspect. So from the attachment theory, you can know that why people, some people have good relationships very easily, why some people cannot build good relationships with other people. And also it, it uh, gave us a suggestion as how we, as a parent, how we interact with the baby is very important for their survival, for their uh, further environment, uh, further development. So uh, let's, uh, let's think about the question. Why, those, why do those children have different attachment styles with the caregiver? So what are the reasons? What are the potential reasons for why children have different attachment styles with the caregiver? You can pause the video right now and think about this question. You can think about it from your personal experience, from your, your observation. Uh, you can talk to other people that you can see right now to discuss this question, to see how, why people have different kinds of attachment styles. So uh, I don't have a very clear answer for this question because I, I'm still learning attachment style, attachment theory. So, uh, but I have, some, I have some thoughts about this question. So why, children have different kinds of attachment styles. Is it because the infants or the babies? Is it because the babies are different, the children are different, so that they have different attachment styles? Uh, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't really believe that's the answer. I believe it's more about how uh, parents or how caregivers respond to children, how they interact with the children in the daily time. So in, the, in that video, Bobby once said uh, that for the ambivalent attachment uh, babies, the caregivers are sometimes not available. Sometimes uh, they're not respond the babies very well. So for maybe for secure attachment babies, every time the baby want to seek the uh, sense of the security from the caregiver, the caregiver is responding very well. 
every time the, uh, the caregiver is able to take care of the baby very well, is able to uh, feed the baby very well, is able to provide safety to the baby very well, is able to respond to uh, uh, the baby's emotional need very well every time, almost every time, so that the baby gradually build a sense, gradually have a knowledge of that, oh, this caregiver is very consistent. I can trust this caregiver. So, you know, trust in the emotional bond is built over time. is is a very long time thing. It's not a one time uh, event. So gradually, the the caregiver can respond the baby very well almost every time. The baby gradually builds the emotional bond with the caregiver, and the following. The result is that the baby have a sense of security when the caregiver is around. So for the ambivalent attachment babies, the caregiver is not consistent. Sometimes uh, they are available. Sometimes the caregiver is not available. Sometimes uh, respond to the baby well. Sometimes uh, the caregiver doesn't respond to the baby very well. Sometimes, yeah, yeah, you know, it's like uh, it's not really. The caregiver is not really uh, trustable. It's not trustworthy. Uh, cannot trust the, the care baby. Cannot trust the caregiver a hundred percent, maybe fifty percent or thirty percent. For the babies with uh, uh, avoidant attachment style, that's it's the caregivers are worse than the. The caregivers with uh, uh, avoid uh, ambivalent attachment babies, they do not really respond to baby's needs, so that the babies cannot build an emotional bond with the caregiver. So the caregiver gradually realize that this caregiver is useless. This caregiver cannot give me the uh, need I I need. So there's no response to the emotional needs. There's no response to the other kinds of needs. So this carriage is not responding, not available. So that's why the baby avoid the caregivers. So th I think that's, that's one reason. So that's a uh, reason about the caregivers characteristics. Maybe there are other reasons for why uh, children have different attachment styles, but I think uh, uh, caregivers' behaviors really play a, an important role in, in creating different kinds of attachment styles. And these different kinds of attachment styles create a different kind of a, 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 a relationship patterns for children. And when they, when they grow up, they have huge and vastly different life because of attachment styles they have when they, are in, when they are infants. So I think that's the takeaway from uh, learning attachment style, att attachment theory. So let's go to another concept, it's called a temperament. So why babies are different? Parents play a really important roles. I just talked about this. Also, parents play a different role in, in not only in relationship patterns, but in other things. Uh, parents are really important for developing children, but the uh, the characteristics from the children themselves are very important too. So temperament is one of them. Temperament is the base for personality. So I believe that you have learned the personality types in a Psych 1 class. So there are different kinds of personality types like an extroversion, like a, a emotional stability, like a openness to experience, all kinds of personality types. So why people have those different types? 
the base of it is temperament. So when infants are born, they are different at the first place. When they are born, they are different. There are different kinds of babies. Some people, babies are really outgoing. They like to interact with the environment. They like to interact with the other people. They make eye contact with the people. They are curious about other people. But some, some babies are not really outgoing. They like to stay alone. Some babies are really quiet. Some babies are really noisy or they like to make, make sounds or they like to, they are active. Some babies are really easily irritated. They get upset really easily. Sometimes uh, some babies are uh, happy almost all the time. So babies are different at the first place. That's because of their characteristics of their neural system. So when they are born, they have an entire neural system. That there are different kinds of the, there are, uh, everybody's neural system has its unique characteristics that determines the temperament, temperament of the baby. So that's why babies have different kinds of a temperament. And also that provides the base for personality. So uh, personality, people's different personality types are the product of the uh, lifetime experiences, but also is really heavily influenced by their temperament at the first place. So you can see, from the birth, they have different temperaments, and based on this temperament, they have different kinds of life experiences. And these life experiences heavily influence their own personality. So, this life experiences kind of modify the temperament of everyone to some degree. And when the babies grow up, when the children grow up, they have different kinds of personalities. So temperament is very important for uh, everyone's uh, development. So that's about infancy. And uh, let's go to another stage. It's uh, early childhood from age two to six. It's major overlap with the two uh, stages in Erickson's psychosocial view. Stage two, autonomy and then stage three, initiative, taking initiative. So you can see that in early childhood is mainly about building a sense of uh, independence, building a sense of autonomy and uh, developing uh, the, the ability, ability or sense of taking initiatives. It's majorly about that. They want, to, they want to be independent. They do not uh, want to just rely on their caregivers. So there are some uh, major characteristics of uh, this stage in the early childhood. The main theme is learn to be autonomous, to take in initiatives. That's what uh, uh, Erickson said. Also, uh, I mean, like from Erickson's theory, it's uh, also about that, about autonomy, about uh, taking initiative, initiatives. That's the main thing in this stage. How to learn to be autonomous, how to learn to, to take initiatives. They engage in playing. So that's why children like to play a lot. They, they kind of uh, imitate what adults do. They simulate the situations. They simulate the scenarios so that they can practice. They can learn how to be autonomous. So playing is very essential for uh, children's growing, children's development. So playing for them is just is not is different from playing for adults. So when we talk about playing, we we talk about we oftentimes talk about inter entertainment. We talk about doing something we shouldn't do. 
that when we talk about playing, but playing for children, especially for early children, that's the work for them. That's the essential for them to do. That's a major thing to do for them. That's why we, that's why they uh, live their life. That's the major meaning for their life is to play. Um, so they, they try different possibilities. They create different possibilities. They want to see the outcomes of every behavior so that they can know oh, how to take an initiative, how to be autonomous, how to be independent. They experiment with different outcomes. They experiment with different, uh, they, they try different behaviors and see what happened. So that all the all, so that they know that uh, <clears throat> how to be independent, how to do different things. Yeah, they want to find out what they can do. They try the possibilities. They try. They try the boundary of their own abilities, and then they extend the boundary outward so they can do more and more things. They can be more and more autonomous and take more and more initi initiatives. And also at the same time, they develop a sense of right and wrong because they try different possibilities. They gradually, they know that what is not allowed, what is allowed. And of course they take more initiatives. They imitate others. That's one way to learn, you know, to, to, uh, to try different possibilities because other people do this and uh, there is an outcome, they observe that. They see, the, oh, if this person does this, and here's the outcome. So why not imitate that person? They also want to do it by themselves and they get outcomes. Oh, that, that they, so that they know that, oh, that's how it happens. That's how to be independent. And uh, at the same time, they learn more social skills because they try to interact with other people, with other kids, but if they have that opportunity. They go to the kindergarten, they hang out with their, uh, with their peers, and they, they interact with their parents, they interact with the, the teachers, and so forth. So they learn more social skills, They're, and also they know their own gender in the socialization process. And in this stage, they learn language. So learning language is very, another important aspect of their development. So people usually, the children usually in age three, they can speak very well their own mother language. Yeah, so these are the characteristics of early childhood. So the major thing is to, to learn how to gain the independence, how to be autonomous, how to take more initiatives. Any effort they, they make is to achieve this goal. So uh, if you have a chance to observe the early ch children, so the children in this age, they're, they're just like that. They, they play all the time. So they're not just the uh, independent themselves. They are growing, they are developing. They, they learn how to live. They learn how to survive in this environment, in this, uh, in this world. So that's early childhood. So here's a, a time for question. So you can think about this question. What is the mo most memorable playing experience that you had during early childhood from age two to six? Probably in that, uh, in that period, you, have, you had some kind of a memory about that time. So what is the most memorable playing experience that you had? and think about it.
you can pause the video right now and think about the question. <clears throat> Okay, so uh, here are some suggestions for parents and parenting. So how to how to educate children, how to raise the children. Here are some suggestions. So the first suggestion uh, is not to not do too much for children. In other words, give them give children more freedom give children more opportunities to explore the environment by themselves. Leave them alone. Do not, do not really do too much for the children. If you do too much for the children, children do not have enough opportunities to explore the world, to take initiative, to learn how to be independent. They need to have the chance. They need to have the freedom and the time. They need to have the room to be themselves, to learn, to grow. Children want to really want to try an experience. They, they really want to try different kinds of experiences. They imitate the adults. They, uh, they uh, explore different places. They, uh, uh, they are curious about everything. They are curious about every object in the environment. I have a, a uh, I actually have a personal experience. My cousin's daughter was like four years ago when her daughter, uh, his daughter was like a uh, two years old. Her daughter was really funny, and her daughter was on the sofa, standing up, and. Uh, The daughter of my cousin on the sofa was standing up and squatting down, standing up and squatting down for many, many, many times. What is, what is, what was she doing? I was really curious about her behavior. I figured out that uh, she was trying to practice the, her own ability to standing up and squatting down. She was just trying really simple actions for many, many, many times. And he was really enjoying it. So that's really magical, I think. And humans are really magical. You know, the, uh, the babies are doing, children are doing really simple actions repeatedly, many, many times, and they are really enjoying it. They are really happy about it. Uh, it's, it's not like uh, adults are not like that. Adults are really, uh, really easily to get satiated. Adults really get bored. Really are are really easy to get bored with something. They need to seek more and more excitement. But babies are trying really simple things, and they really enjoy it. So that's, that's the uh, one example that children want to try and experience. The counter example of this is, uh, is called a helicopter parenting or over parenting. So what, why is it called helicopter parenting? So it's just like uh, the parents are just like a helicopters or, uh, that are hovering above uh, their, their uh, children's heads. You know, you, you can imagine what it, it feels. There's there's noise. Uh, there's always a noise above the head. The, the, the noise comes from the parents. So that's why it's called a helicopter parenting. So uh, what their parents are like, they are always worrying about the problems that children have. They're always worrying and they're always complaining they are always showing the anxiety to the children that, oh, why you are doing this? Why you are you do not do this? If you do this, it will be screwed. Uh, if you do this, that's too dangerous. Do not do that. Do that. 
over parents or helicopter parents are, are like that. And they do everything right for the children. They think, oh, this is right. Do it for the children. Eat this, eat more vegetables. Do not eat too, too much meat. That's one example. Because vegetables are healthy for your body, so you should eat a lot of vegetables. And try to solve every problem for children. When there's a problem, solve the children's problem for children. So children do not have the opportunity to overcome the, the problems, to solve the problem by themselves. They do not have the opportunity to take initiatives, to be autonomous. They do not have the opportunity to grow up. So the really uh, severe consequence of helicopter parenting or overparenting is that children cannot grow up. Children cannot live, they cannot control their life, to be honest. They cannot be autonomous. They, talk, they, cannot, they do not know how to solve problems in life. So that's one suggestion for parents. If you're already parents or you're, you're going to be parents in the future, remember this suggestion. So do not do too much for the children. And the second suggestion is that accepting every emotion that a child has if you really love them, accept every aspect of them, especially every emotion, the full range of children's feelings. Children have would have different feelings because they are humans. Humans have all kinds of emotions and feelings. If they have negative feelings, it's okay. It's okay for them to express. That's also a way to be themselves. It's also a way to, uh, <clears throat> for them to learn how they are, what they feel, so that they can know what things make them feel bad, what things may make them feel good. If they do, if you do not allow children to have to express negative feelings, they are, they cannot know why they have negative feelings. When they express the negative feelings they will gradually know, oh, in this situation, I have negative feelings. So that's also the opportunity for themselves, for the children to learn themselves, to learn what they are like. <clears throat> so the second suggestion is to accept the full range of children's feelings. That's, these are two suggestions for parents. And next one, we can know some uh, knowledge about parenting styles. There are basically uh, three types of parenting styles. The first one is called authoritative parents. So uh, the second one is called authoritarian parents and the third one is called permissive parents so how these parents are are different from each other so actually uh, they divide these parents according to two dimensions so the first dimension is about the the support and the second dimension is about the demands so Parents give support to children so that uh, children can do things, can grow up. Also, children, uh, parents demand, have demands from uh, children, demand children. They ask children to, to, to do something or not to do something. So one hand is support, on the other hand is demand. So here is a... Support. She is also demand. Yeah, it's like a two dimensional. Hmm. 
Yeah. Um, so authoritative style is characterized by high support and high demand. It means that uh, they gave a lot of support. They give a lot of help to the children. But at the same time, they have high expectations on the children. They ask the children to do a lot of things. They ask the children to behave based on their own demands. They provide the, the goals and the structure for the children. So the structure is actually the help. It's not a like physical structure, but it's it's like a guidance of how children behave. That's the help that children can get from the, the parents so that they can rely on the structure, rely on the, the support and help and achieve those goals. So as a consequence, when these kind of children grow up with, with authoritative parenting style, they can rely on themselves they have really high self-control because they are, they are, you know, they are asked by their parents to do a lot of things. They can, they can control themselves well, very well. They are able to cope with stress, and they have a orientation to to gain achievement because uh, when they grow up, they have the goals. They have the, the support to achieve the goals. So they can get pleasure from achieving the goals. So that's, they are oriented to gain high achievement. They seek achievement. They want to have really, really uh, a lot of achievements. So that's the consequence of authoritative parenting. The next one is called uh, authoritarian parenting. So this one is uh, different from authoritative. This one is high demand, but low support. So this kind of parents demand a lot, have a lot of expectations on children, ask a lot of children to do a lot of things, but they do not really give support. So uh, children are, they, they are harsh on children actually. They use punishment to control children because they do not give support, but they ask the children to do a lot of things. If the children are not do something that are not expected by their, themselves, by their, by the parents, parents use some kind of a, a, a punishment to treat the children. So uh, children are controlled by the authoritarian parents. As a consequence, they are fearful when they grow up, when the children grow up. They are vulnerable to stress. They lack purpose because when they grow up, they do not have a sense of purpose. The parents do not give them purposes or goals to achieve. So it's totally different from authoritative parenting style. And the next one is permissive parenting style. Uh, it's categorized by low demand, but low support. Oh yeah, so it's, it's different from uh, other two parenting styles. Low demand, low support. They do not give support. They do not provide the, the help, uh, support, the structure, the goals to the children. But at the same time, they do not provide the, they do not have high expectations on children as well. So what specifically, they will indulge children's desires. They will, they will be like, whatever you want, you get it. I do not uh, expect, uh, so I, I do not expect you behave well, or I do not expect you do something. Whatever you want, it's okay. But I will not provide a lot of uh, help to you. Just to, yeah, just leave the children alone, just like that. Um, so the when the children grow up with this kind of a parenting style, they cannot rely on themselves. They have low self-reliance. They do not have a lot of self-control because they, their desires, their impulses are not controlled. They are really impulsive. 
if they want to get something, they want to get it really quick, no matter what. They do not consider the physical, uh, or the realistic constraints. They do not consider, oh, I, I probably I need to behave well to get that. They'll not think of that because the parents do not treat that way. Treat the, uh, the parents do not treat them that way. They do not have a lot of purposes. They are not really oriented to have high achievements. So their achievement orientation is really low. So basically they are impulsive and they want to satisfy their impulse, satisfy their own desires. They do not control themselves. They do not want to really have some kind of achievements or realize some kind of goals. So you can tell which parenting style is better, is the best. Uh, I think uh, comparing the consequences among these uh, parenting styles, authoritative parenting style is the best one. This one is the best one, but uh, it depends on your thoughts about uh, this parenting style. So I think the authoritative one is the best one because uh, when children grow up with this kind of parenting style, they can control themselves, can, they can rely on themselves, they can be successful. They, they can make a lot of achievements. So these are the three parenting styles. Okay, so let's go to next stage, that is middle childhood. That's from age two, six to 12. That is consistent with the Erickson psychosocial view of uh, stage four. So it's about building self-confidence, industry versus inferiority. So in this stage, really important thing for them to do is building self-confidence, building the belief that they're capable, they're confident, they're able to do things. So there are some uh, characteristics of this, this stage. The first one is that that's the stage really, that is really crucial for them to develop self-concept. So self-concept is the knowledge about themselves. So self-confidence is one a part of self-concept, the knowledge about who they are. They start to realize that, oh, they themselves are a person. They themselves have different kinds of aspects, just like other people. So who they are, they want to know about it. So they, they kind of develop a self-concept. They start to engage in more social events they are socializing more. And also in this stage, they develop a sense of values. They start to understand some abstract things like honesty, like courage. So these are values. They start to know about these abstract concepts. They start to have these values. They start to behave based on these values. They start based, uh, behave based on some abstract principles or abstract values. So before this stage, people, uh, children, their thinking is more concrete. They start, they have feelings, they experience different things, uh, but it's more concrete. It's less abstract, but starting from this start stage, they start to uh, be able to have some kind of uh, abstract thinking ability. So they start to understand values and principles, rules, like something like that. So they start to develop a sense of values. Yeah, also in this stage, it's really important for them to have some uh, cognitive skills, language skills, such as reading and writing. 
So that's why they go to elementary school in the stage. They learn how to read and write. And there are more uh, characteristics in the stage, but uh, we can cover this many stages. Uh, we can talk about this uh, characteristics so far. So these are characteristics of uh, middle adults. So basically they start to socialize more. They start to know who they are. They start to uh, engage in more uh, abstract thinking. And also they start to have higher levels of cognitive skills, such as reading and writing. And the next stage is uh, adolescence. From age 13 to 20, that's corresponding to Erickson's stage five, identity versus confusion. So that's the stage that they start to build identities. They do not only want to know who they are, but they want to know what position they are in, in the society. Yeah, critical to develop uh, the identity. They different. They uh, explore different roles because they want to see where they are in the social relationships, or uh, where they are in the society. So they explore different roles. They also form gender identities. So basically, they really clear know what gender they are, male or female because males and females are very different in this stage. And uh, we all know that uh, from this stage, uh, adolescents become uh, sexually mature. So they need to know who they are. Like they need to know what identity, what gender they are, male or female. And they learn to have more intimate relationships. That's also the preparation for the next stage, for being adults. So they start to deeply socialize with other people. They're deeply assimilated to the society, to the uh, social environment. They are not satisfied just uh, interacting with their own parents or families or uh, teachers, they start to uh, try more possibilities to build more in relationships with the other people. And they're, they start to be more influenced by groups instead of parents. And uh, in this process, it's also called individuation. It means that they are separate from the family. They are not part of the family anymore they start to build their own identity. They start to realize that they are individuals. They are separate from their parents. They behave based on their own will. <clears throat> they need to bear the consequences. They need to bear the consequences of their own choices. So that's the process of individuation. And it is difficult for most people because it's not easy to find the, the position in the social relationship. It's not uh, easy for to be part of a larger society. So before this stage, before this, uh, before the adolescence, children are just to think about uh, their own stuff. Own stuff. They they just think about how to interact with parents. That's it. That's their world. Their world is really small, but starting from that adolescence, their world becomes really, really large because they are trying to assimilate it into the whole society. That makes and that that situation makes it really complex and challenging. <clears throat> okay, so that's adolescence. That's just a brief view of uh, adolescence. Here are two questions to you to for you to think about. First one, what major choices did you struggle during your adolescent years? You can talk about 
your struggle and uh, you can talk about what kind of choices you, uh, that you struggle. And the second question is, how do you think your adolescence affected the person you are today? In other words, like how adolescence play a role in creating the current you. So how you are infected by the by your adolescent years. So you can think about that. And you, you can pause the video right now and think about the question. Okay, so let's go to uh that's all the stuff for this week's lecture. Let's go to so uh, this week, we have a uh, uh, talk about uh, the uh, the, uh, uh, the stuff about the childhood and adolescence. So in journal two, the second journal, the journal assignment for chapter two, we are going to do this. So pictures and photos often say more about ourselves than words do. So by this coming Sunday, look through any pictures of yourself as a child, any photos and pictures of yourself as a child and uh, adolescence, and see if there are any striking things. So I totally believe that you have gone through childhood and adolescence. So find pictures of yourself as a child and adolescence, and discover any themes are same striking. So in this journal, please answer the following questions. What do these pictures reveal about you? So any themes about yourself through these photos or pictures. So you can talk about any themes from these pictures. Also find out any factors such as parenting styles, attachment styles, groups, culture and other factors that might impact your development during childhood and adolescence using the knowledge that we learned in the class. So find out any factors that impact your development during those life stages. Yeah, so uh, you need to use the, uh, the knowledge that we learned from, the, we learned from uh, this class. So note that the length of the journal ranges from one page to two pages, double spaced. So it will be due this uh, this Sunday at the midnight. And uh, that's it for for uh, chapter two. And uh, uh, after this, please uh, watch the video for chapter three. And uh, see you soon.